Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. It's over to you. Um, thank you, Ellen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the wonderful women, wherever you are joining from. I want to invite you to the local Women uh, Forum for Peace. Uh, this is an, a meeting for women by women. And this afternoon, we will be looking at uh, two case studies of uh, how peace is being championed in different countries. We are glad to be joined by two wonderful ladies, Dr. Elona Nwadinobi from Nigeria and uh, Lois Ndegwa from Kenya. They will be sharing their experiences with us as we celebrate uh, 20 years of Resolution 1325. Uh, a few uh, issues that we may want to consider as we engage in this uh, session. Uh, we will be recording the proceedings and they can be available later on uh, at the CODI website and also uh, through the CODI YouTube. In regard to that, we request that if you will not be speaking, kindly ensure that your uh, microphone is muted for the panelists. Uh, let's also um, ensure that when the other panelist is speaking, my, your microphone is muted. Um, secondly, we will encourage us to use the chat box for our comments. We will have a question and answer session from the participants, but uh, we will start by the panelists sharing. Uh, Dr. Elena will of course share on the case study from uh, Nigeria and Lois will share on the case study from Kenya. And then you will have an opportunity to make a comment. Uh, Elena, you will make a comment on um, the case study by Lois and Lois, of course, you're going to make a comment on the case study shared by Dr. Elena. For our attendees, uh, kindly feel free to use the chat box and post a question, but we'll also have a question and answer session towards the end. With me, in terms of moderation, uh, I'm being assisted by uh, Abby from Nigeria. And of course, our lady, Dr. Robin, is also going to help us. So uh, myself and Robin will keep track of what is happening in the chat box as Abby takes over. So let me first uh, invite our panelists to just uh, say hi to the participants and attendees, uh, starting with Dr. Elena, just saying hi, welcome. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you very much and Lois. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, Robin, you can say hi and then we allow Abby to say hi and take over. Okay. All right, Abby. Abby, take okay, over. Okay, thank you very much, Salome. Thank you, Salome. And greetings to all our panelists and participants who have joined us for today's section. We we'll hope you enjoy the section while you stay tuned with us to listen and also learn from the case studies from the two African countries. So I will be reading out the profile of the first speaker with Dr. Elena Nwadiebo, is MBBS EMA FAAC. She's a medical doctor and an international health, women, peace and security, gender and human rights expert. She holds European Union Masters in Human Rights and democratization for, from Venice, Italy. She is the international president of the Medical Women International Association and founding co-chair of Every Women's Treaty, coalition advocate for global treaty to end violence against women and girls. And she is the immediate past Sub-Sahara Africa 
Regional Chair of the United Nations NGO DPI Executive Committee. For five years, from 2012 to 2017, she has worked with DFID, founded, founded Nigeria Stability and Reconciliation Program called NSRP. It's a peace building program managed by a consortium of the British Council, Social Development Direct and International Halat. First, as a gender advisor and then as a woman and girls manager. In her role, she worked to support the Nigerian government to draft and launch the, their first national action plan on women, peace, and security from 2013 to 2016. Additionally, she supervised a federal level civil society network on WPS and eight state level WPS network, culminating in eight states and five local government action plans on women, peace, and security. More recently, she provided technical assistance for Nigeria's second national action plan on women, peace, and security. Please welcome to the platform Dr. Eleanor Owabdebo to share more light on the case study. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Abby, for that um, glowing introduction. I'll continue to say happy International Peace Day, everyone. Every day should be a day of peace for us. But I know it's great that we set aside one day in particular where we make an extra effort for that ceasefire. Let me thank immensely the Cody International Institute and all those who have worked to um, bring these sessions together. It, yesterday, the opening ceremony was truly wonderful and I know that we have enjoyed all the sessions. So today in the Strengthening Local Structures and Practices session um, in the Local Women's Voices for Peace conference, it is my pleasure to share with you um, the case study of peace clubs that were set up between 2012 and 2017, thanks to a DFID funded program that I worked on called the Nigeria Stability and Reconciliation Program, which was set up to address key elements of conflict in different parts of Nigeria. In the south, around the oil extractive industry, in the middle belt around farmers herders conflicts and in the northeast around the Boko Haram conflict. So just to give a quick background, you know that women and girls, boys and men experience conflict quite differently and you know are subject to different forms of violence with women and girls more likely to experience sexual and viol uh, sexual violence while men and boys more likely to be detained by security sector forces and drawn into gangs and militia. And Nigeria has a background of being deeply rooted in patriarchy and with men and women socialized differently and you know, disparities in their access to power, to resources. And in the midst of this, you have an estimated 35% of women and girls who are 15 years or older um, experiencing one form of violence or the other. So let me, um, let's look at safe spaces, which is what we, we called the Peace Clubs. Um, the Peace Clubs initiative focused on building the capacity of young people within the ages of 10 to 24. And the idea was to have a facilitated process with Peace Club attendees who were taught life skills to prevent and respond to violence against women and girls, to prevent conflict, 
to denounce harmful practices like drug addiction, cult and gang activities. And we used the term safe spaces to refer to autonomous physical spaces for young people, ensuring that the public space was specially safe for them. Um, the objectives were both to assist women and girls to overcome barriers to their participation and increase in accountability of formal as well as informal mechanisms at state and community level, especially addressing violence against women and girls. So these safe spaces were identified by young people themselves as, sa as safe. So we went into the communities and we weren't prescriptive in pointing out and saying, here's a safe space for you. What we did was to engage with the community members and say to them, you know, where is it that you particularly feel safe congregating or aggregating? And we discovered that these spaces were not um, fixed in the case of informal spaces, because you could find that, for example, a safe space for a group of hawkers could have, would have been under the tree in the dry season, but they wouldn't be under that tree because of the seasons of weather during the rainy season. You had those who said the school space was safe. Others identified worship centers as safe spaces, so churches and mosques. And, you know, just places where the young people would collectively come together and could easily discuss issues regarding their well being and could also feel safe to speak up against duty bearers and whether duty bearers were, you know, could be held accountable. And we discovered that when we started in 2012, community members identified school spaces as safe, but by the time the abduction of the Chibok girls happened in 2014. Before that, there was this issue of the burning of a boys' school in Buniyadi. And after that, the abduction of girls in their schools in Dapchi, it now became clear that for some, schools are actually not safe spaces. So how, what did we do to get these peace clubs underway? Before going to the methodology, I would like to you know, go through the objectives of the peace clubs. Why did we as a conflict program think of peace clubs? They were to provide for boys and girls, women and men, a safe space. It was an opportunity to have a facilitated uh, um, way of engaging with them to enhance their self-esteem, to equip them with tools to negotiate conflict in their own lives and in the wider community. They could learn about gender-based violence and the prevention, learning to speak up for themselves, taking healthy living choices. It was a place for rights liter literacy, and it was a place for peer learning and a way in which they could look at making themselves more useful to their communities. So the idea when we started, we said, let's have formal peace clubs in school spaces for those who had formal education and informal peace clubs for those who did not have formal education. And the original idea was to have ages uh, uh, 10 to 16 
and then 17 to 24. So we had the Big Brother Club was 17 to 24, Big Sister Club the same age. Then we had the Little Brother 10 to 16 and the Little Sister 10 to 16. But guess what? Once we started going uh, the, uh, to get the peace clubs underway, in certain parts of Nigeria, we found out that parents were not happy to let their 10-year-old daughters between the ages of 10 to 13 go for the peace clubs. So being a very adaptive program, we introduced the aunties clubs. And who were these aunties? These aunties were trusted family members, females, 24, aged 24 and above, who would be in an adjoining peace club to the peace club that had the younger, the little sisters. So for each of the clubs, a club constituted of five units, which we called clublets little sister, little brother, big sister, big brother, and aunties. So that if we were under a tree training the group of little sisters, their aunties who were sometimes their big sisters or real aunties or just trusted older females in the community were there as chaperones within shouting distance and not too far from the youngsters. Now, we equipped the Peace Club attendees with identity cards, they had badges, school clubs, the boys were given flannels and the girls were given hygiene packs, they had stationery and we developed a manual. They also had their, 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 their each facilitator for each clublet had a mobile phone and they were taught because some of them needed to be taught how to send text messages. The facilitators had to be those who were literate to send text messages and they each clublet had a solar powered radio. So the idea was we developed a peace club manual that, you know, had standalone modules and the facilitator had, you know, the, the, the freedom to spend as much time on a particular module depending on the uptake of the peace club attendees. So life skills, self-esteem, communication, negotiation, livelihoods, trauma healing, and you know, uh, participating in the communities. And the facilitators used to send their reports by text message to members of NSRP. Those facilitators went through a very rigorous selection process we had to make sure that there was safeguarding by the civil society organizations who supervised each of the clubs. In the period of the five years, we had 11,709 Peace Club attendees, of which 7,405 were girls and 4,304 were boys in 40 peace clubs with the five clublets that I uh, mentioned. Now, let me go quickly to the achievements. We were able to record some huge success stories. Because we were in different parts of the country, we had, for example, in River State, members who had been, who were um, reformed cult members. So there was an issue around cult and gangs in the southern part of Nigeria around the extractive industry. And through our peace clubs, cult members denounced cultism and 
followed the course of reform through Peace Club inter interventions. We had them actually partner with security agents so that they signed peace pacts with uh, security agencies and began to work with security agencies to improve their communities. We also had a situation where in peace clubs, through the peace clubs, they were able to get girls in regular school to lead some of the school activities which had never happened before. We had a situation where without support, those who admired this, the peace club intervention now created more peace clubs within the communities. Some of the community activities that the uh, Peace Club attendees was such that we had a, 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 an attendee who was out of school and you know, selling pure water, now requested of her community that she wanted support to attend proper school. And the community rallied round her because they had seen how much she had become a leader in her community. In, in Borno State, where we had the, the Boko Haram conflict, we had 35 street hawkers who mm -hmm. decided to take on an alternative uh, 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 income generating activity. Yeah. The community rallied around them and based on their, their abilities, they were able to set them up, uh, uh, the older ones in small scale bus businesses. The communities themselves now discovered that thanks to the Peace Club attendees that the, the um, level of criminality in the communities uh, reduced. But we did have challenges. As I, as I round up, we had challenges. We had issues, for example, of the, the name club in, in a particular part of Nigeria was misunderstood as a nightclub. And so we had to go the extra mile to explain to members of the community that a club was not a night a, a, a nightclub. We had issues around attrition because some of those in the informal peace clubs, the clubs that the, those who were meeting in sheds under the trees, some of them belonged to nomadic communities. So we had um, attrition and movement. We had issues around seasonal um, variation. And there were those who felt the peace clubs were, were providing only Western education until the facilitators who were providing Sangaya education were able to, to let them know otherwise. So as I conclude, one of the things that you might want to ask is, well, that support was only for five years. And what has happened since? You have to realize that when you have programs that are funded of this nature, they are intended to fill gaps where there are systemic failures. And these short program lifespans sometimes are not long enough to entrench long lasting visible change. But the reality is when you now have the opportunity to go back and measure impact, I have had up until you know to to, to the, this present time, and this program was something that closed down three years ago in 2017. Facilitators calling me to say, "Oh, peace club attendees have either excelled in community work, or excelled in their schools, or they are now community leaders," and we were able to link the peace clubs with another part of the program, which was an observatory on violence against women and girls, where we found out that we were able through peace clubs to break the silence around violence against women and girls because the, the girls who were violated 
found that they were in a safe space. They had a trusted facilitator. The facilitator could send a report via text message to an observatory steering committee that was also supported with healthcare personnel, legal personnel, security sector personnel, and community leaders. And the observatory was very linked to the Peace Club initiative where we were taking reports and responding to reports of violence. I'll stop for now and I'm sure we can get more information during question and answer time. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Eleanor. We really learned a lot from the case study and to hear about how you balanced with the informal sector, carrying the informal youths along in the whole process and also some of the necessary requirements for establishment of a peace club was also one of the takeaways for me. So I will now ask our second speaker, Lois, to please uh, make a few comments about this case study. Hello, thank you, doctor. Thank you for the information. I have learned a lot from that case study and I have found it very unique and especially uh, the age of the, the club members. Actually from 10 years, I think that's a very, very unique thing. I have learned a lot because I would say in Kenya, it would be a bit tricky for parents to allow their children to participate in such peace clubs. And I have learned of how they also found it a challenge with some of the parents and even the uniqueness of how they went around convincing them through the ants, ants club to, to allow the children to participate. I have learned a lot and I have liked that the the idea it is it i am sure it would also be a very good uh, thing to adapt in kenya i have liked the club thing and i i think i have gotten an idea of something we can also adapt and and do for this matter thank you thank Thanks. you so um, much lois from uh, for your brief comments about the case study. I will now hand over to Salome to carry on with the next panel. Participants can keep their comments coming in the chat box while we wait for the second speaker to finish our presentation before we take comments from participants. So over to you, Lloyd and Salome. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elena, and thank you, Lois, for your comments. Uh, before I invite Lois, I will um, do the honors of introducing Lois the best way I know her. And uh, for me, Lois has been one of the champions of rights in Kenya. She has been quite active on matters uh, peace and security. She comes from one of the counties in Kenya where uh, conflict and peace uh, uh, do not walk hand in hand. And what do I mean by this? I mean, uh, every other day she has to leave, see, and try to intervene when these things happen, and it is not easy. So I would rather dwell on Lois, the uh, peacekeeper at the community level, Lois, the uh, woman human rights defender, and of course, Lois, the lady who is here to share with us. In another life beyond uh, her work as a defender, Lois has been a uh, secretary at uh, her county and uh, I would invite her to share a little bit, not just on the case study that she wants to share with us, but her other life, not as a peacekeeper, uh, a, peace, a woman peace developer. So welcome Lois and feel free to introduce yourself on anything I might have left out. Karibu. Thank you very much, Salome. And thank you for the invite. I am excited about it. 
uh, I think you have said almost everything that you know about me and I would also add that I am also a community community leader. We have forest community associations, people who deal with environment and I am also a secretary in there and you realize in the forest there, there, is, there are resources and there are conflicts all over. Like for example, when you're in the forest, there's one of the one of the one of the of the of the of the conflict that comes up is a uh, conflict on water. You realize there are sometimes the, it is so dry and people upstream the rivers will also block the water from flowing downstream. And I also work there in trying to bring peace between the communities when they disagree with the, around the resources that are not obviously enough for everyone. After my introduction, I will say, I have been in peace building for women and ladies, and also for children. For quite some time, I joined a peace a NGO in 2008, that is called PeaceNet Kenya, where we were, I was trained in dealing with peace. And I have been uh, in the commit peace committees, in the district peace committees, where we have also experienced conflict, and especially when it comes to illegal groupings, that is militia groups, and also domestic violence where I live is, is an area where we have domestic violence. Sometimes you get sexual violence. Sometimes you have uh, alcoholism. And in the case study that I am about to talk about is where after we have come from 2008 is when we have, we came and got uh, an area where the, 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 the right, the, 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 we here commonly call them border border riders, where people use, use motorbikes for their tra transport. So at the district level, we realized that the, the groups, the, 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 the men that are, or the youth and men that are using the, the, the means of transport, the border border riding as, as their businesses, they, are, they, they became vulnerable in being used, especially by politic, politicians to bring chaos in the, in, the, in, the, in the area. And that is when we came up and we joined together to find a way of bringing them together so that we can be able to to train them, for them to learn how they would do their businesses without actually causing chaos and, and being involved in illegal activities. And with that, we came up with, uh, with, with uh, an idea where we, 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 we started going around the towns and bringing them together and mobilizing them to to join groups and, and register groups that are officially registered so that they will have leaders who will guide, who will help us to bring them together and train them. And there was a very, very uh, serious area and especially the bordering of our county and our neighboring county called Kedenyaga, where at some point we had the, 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 those people joined together and so many people were killed in, in that area. There was a, a challenge and especially when you are a, a lady and you have got to go and take some, uh, some meetings with those people and go about the, 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 the incident that had happened and security especially is that was a challenge but uh, up to where we are now we have been able to form those groups and we have been able to train them to have trainings through the through uh, um, 
through an, another NGO also funded by Germany to bring them together into groups and form training, have training with them and we, they usually have uh, meetings every, every week, once a week, where we join them uh, depending on the timetable, time where we join them and, and talk to them and have the issues. In those groups that we have formed, they have also they all, we also help them to register their, their uh, to register the, uh, the way they would also save and also build them uh, their livelihoods. And also in this in this case study, we have seen uh, achievements in how we have brought them together. And even we realize, we also realize they are also are not able also to improve their lives and even to groom themselves. So we also brought together um, other stakeholders who also train them on how to go about daily, their daily lives. And that has been an achievement. We have seen them, we have seen those groups registered groups come together and also been able to convince them even to not participate in the, the, the activities that would also be a threat to the peace of, of other people. You realize also in this case that most mostly the people who use the border borders or the motorbikes to ride are ladies, are women and girls. And we also had cases where maybe a woman is, is it takes the, the, the ride and at, a, at, at some point they will be taken the, 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 up the, into the other ways that they, are, they were not riding and there you realize that when they get to a point they are raped and they are they are, they, 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 and they are raped and and or maybe um, maybe violated by, by, by the riders. So we have also been able to, to make them learn to get out of those illegal activities. I will end there and I hope you have learned something from my case study. Um, thank you, Lois, uh, for the sharing. I want to invite Dr. Elena uh, to just give a comment or two on the case study that uh, Lois has shared before uh, Abby takes it up with a questions and answers session. So, Diana, welcome. Lois, thank you so very much for, you know, such an enlightening contribution. And, you know, I applaud your courage in the work that you're doing you know, working, telling us about your work in the forest. In fact, as you mentioned that I had lovely memories of the very rare opportunity I had of meeting the late uh, Mama Wangari Matai in, uh, in Strasbourg. And, you know, um, as you spoke about that, I, I remember that, you know, Kenya has such a wonderful legacy. I applaud your courage, um, um, Lois. And, you know, the, the fact that, you know, you're working with the Boda Boda riders, and I see similarities with Nigeria where they too here are used by, you know, um, politicians. And, you know, I've learned a lot from how you have engaged with them. And um, it's sad to hear that, you know, uh, women and girls also suffer um, sexual violence in the course of using, you know, the Boda Boda, which they would use for transportation. Thank you very much, Louis, for sharing um, the, the incredible work that you're doing. And please be encouraged. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elona. I want to invite Abby to lead us into the question and answer session. And to our attendees, we now open up the floor. You are free to ask questions to both uh, Dr. Elena and Luis. 
However, before Abby takes it up, I had noticed two, two requests that had come through the chat box. One was uh, direct to uh, Dr. Elena. Somebody was asking where they can get the case study. I'm sure you can direct us to it. And then the other, the other request was to both of us uh, in terms of whether we can share our email contacts uh, with attendees so that they can have, they can engage with you both later. So feel free to share. Abby, welcome and pick their question and answer session. Okay, okay thank you so much, Alume. I must say I've shared the link to the YouTube video for this case study Dr. Helen has shared. So it's on the chat box or you can scroll down, you will see the YouTube video for the case study. You know, you must agree with me that women are really organizing local support and resources to address conflicts conflict in their communities in order to foster peace and justice. And that's the whole essence of um, this whole discussion, setting up structures and support system. And from the two case study, we could see similarities carrying the various stakeholders along in whatever establishment you have to do and also involving the support of key decision makers in whatever we're doing is one of the key things that you know is important in the case study. So I will now leave it up open to participants to ask their questions. So if you have uh, questions or cons contributions, You can also comment, you can raise up your hand. Okay. So I'm going through the chat box to see if there's any question for any of our speakers. Whilst, whilst we are waiting for the questions to come up, it's just to um, echo what um, Abby has said already. There is a, a YouTube video, the link is in the chat. And um, I've seen in the chat that we have with us, we have the pleasure of having um, Uchenna uh, Wokedi, who also uh, worked on the Peace Club program, and we also have with us Rosemary, who's an international mediator. So I don't know if, you know, they have um, comments yeah. to... Yeah. Trying to go through the chat box to see if, okay, Uche now, or anybody's raising up their hand. Not at the moment. Okay, Uchena is raising up her hand. Can we unmute her? So we have two people. Can we unmute? You can unmute yourself, Uchena. Then afterwards, Rosemary will make a few comments. So Abby, I have to move the attendees over because this is a webinar format. Okay. So I'll allow them to talk just one second. Okay. Uchenna, I think you should be able to go ahead now. And Rosemary, you'll be next. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Ellen, for sharing the um, Peace Club, the NSRP experience. And welcome, everyone. Um, I have just a contribution to make and also a comment. And maybe this comment will be directed to Dr. Ellen. Um, Dr. Ellen, considering the work that NSRP did, uh, with the youth on the Peace Club initiative. Um, don't we think um, Nigeria should begin to look at how we're going to uh, integrate or incorporate uh, 
the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2250 that talks about um, involving youth in peace building. You know, um, I would like to know, or it may be also good if you can share with the with the house now uh, what Nigeria is doing in that direction. So, like, uh, because that is about taking the peace club thing forward. You know. Thank you, Tina, for the question. I will hand over to Doctor. Eleanor, to respond to this question before we take the next one. Thank you very much, Uchenna, for that hugely important question. Um, exactly as you have said, you know, with, with the focus on um, 1325 on women, peace, and security, um, you have to realize that it took Nigeria 13 years to have their first national action plan on women, peace, and security, despite being one of all the nations in the world that uh, signed up in the year 2000. So, you know, sadly, we have a history of being slow in domesticating. You are also aware that uh, part, an integral part of the National Pact Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security was the, uh, it was the Nigerian Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. Again, that took 14 years. So quite right in the context of 2250, time has come for us to integrate all the gains the lessons, the focus, the inclusion of our young people as you know, laid out in 2250. And uh, the, the gains of the Peace Club, that is where we should look towards. It's going to take concerted effort. It's going to the sort of effort, and that's why I gave the history and our background of how long it took us to get our National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. And one of the things I mentioned during my contribution is the fact that, you know, we, we appreciate the, the, uh, uh, th those who um, assist us with um, donor aid. In fact, the history of Nigeria's National Action Plan, the first and second generation on women, peace and security cannot be told without the help of the UK government DFID and the help of UN women. But you know, we need to realize that nation states themselves are responsible for ensuring that you know, they, they domesticate these laws, these instruments, these policies. And when we do get donor aid through programs, they have a lifespan. So it's time for the Nigerian government, as you so eloquently said, Uchenna, and we look to civil society. We look to, you know, it, it has to be a whole of society and a whole of government approach because any country, wherever we are on earth, that fails, to invest in its young people has failed to invest in its future. A lot of times young people are told you're the future, but to be honest, our young people are the now, because if we continue referring to them as the future, then it means that we have not created the space for them. The future is for those yet unborn, but for your young people, they are the now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Helena. So now we'll give the floor to Rosemary to ask a question. Rosemary, can you unmute yourself? Um, I think I've unmuted myself. I don't have a question. I have more of a contribution than a question. I would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Helena for her presentation, well detailed. I'll call that vintage Helena. Um, my contribution is this. We always have um, this um, firebrand approach to managing conflicts and uh, peace building. 
here's my take. Um, mediation actually, when applied early, is used to prevent conflict. We don't have to wait for conflict to happen before we start trying to build the peace. So we can try to um, use these skills, mediation and conflict resolution skills to prevent conflicts before it escalates. We all have, not just in Nigeria, all over Africa, have this approach of force, using force to, to douse situations when it has polarized. Let's learn to use the skills to prevent. By prevent, I mean getting people to acquire the skills in the local settings so that as things are rearing their heads, they will be able to douse it before it gets to the point of uh, using force. And when it's doused early, you find that force is not needed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for your contribution. So now I would uh, read out one of the questions that we have, and it's, uh, and it's for both our speakers. Lindian is asking how we can gain trust of the community to start a Peace Corps and also let the parents send their sons and daughters to the Peace Club. So it's just about acceptance of necessary stakeholders to your Peace Club. You know, Dr. Elena, you talked about the misconception about the word club. So how do you go about that, resolving that? And I will allow Lois to start first on um, to answer this question, then Dr. Elena can wrap up. Lois, are you there? I am there. I'm sorry, I did not hear the question. I, I had a cough. Okay. And I had... Okay. Let me come again. So, how can you gain trust of the community to start a police call? So, I don't know if you have any uh, comments no, on that. Right now, we don't have peace clubs, and we can trust the uh, the community. They can. I am sure we can trust them, and they can trust us and we can have them. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Dr. Eleanor, can you respond to this question on how we can gain trust to start a peace club and also how to convince the parents of teenagers to allow their children to come to the peace club? Thank you very much. Um, the first thing, um, the, you know, there wasn't time to go through the process, but the first thing is reconnaissance. You go into the community and it's usually good to find somebody who is a trusted member of the community to take you into the community if it is one that you are not familiar with as a practitioner. So to do that reconnaissance, somebody takes you into the community and a lot of our communities have community leaders, men and women. And we need to show by example, by being inclusive. Yes, we know that most of our communities are led by men, but as you pay homage to whoever the leader is, that's there and then that you say, right, so who are your relig religious leaders? They might want to point to somebody who is their own faith leader, but you also ask, are there other faiths? You know, are the, who, are the, who are the other respected people? Who is the oldest woman in the community? You know, who is in charge of, you know, the market? So you want to have a very inclusive reconnaissance. You want to engage with the gatekeepers because you, you do your community assessment so that you understand what has gone on in that community before. Now that you are coming in, then you learn the language. There are some communities where a, a, a word that you used in one language is 
taboo in the next language. We had a community in the south of Nigeria where the, the, the conflict was divided by a road. There were the two communities on either side, on opposite sides of the road in conflict. And it was because of a football match in an English league and they were ready to burn down their houses. So if the mention of a particular English football name is going to cause people to burn down houses, you must not you know, do harm by not being con conflict sensitive. So gaining the trust is, is, is a, you know, it's a multi-layered, uh, um, um, assignment. And there is something, you know, conflict sensitivity is a huge area in on its own. What language must we not use? What are the titles of the people? What are the perceptions of young people? Who are the youth leaders? You know, what is it that, that you know, do they worship their stream? Do they, do they worship, you know, a, 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 a particular you know, uh, um, uh, um, tree, then you want to find out what are the community conflict management mechanisms. So that if you're going into the community, we came across one community where all they need is for the oldest person in community, man or woman, to take an iron rod. And if that iron rod is driven into the ground, even if people are wielding knives, everybody has to stop. So you find out about those community conflict management mechanisms, you know, themselves, so that you're aware of it. And then you then apply that to peace clubs because nobody is going to trust you if you come, for example, with a prescriptive method of doing things. When they have their way of doing things and you have to show respect and then you work with them. It is a joint venture. And then for peace clubs, by the time you get, let's say the first five people in a peace club and you have one of those children going home and saying, oh, look, I'm proudly wearing a peace club badge. I'm interested in cleaning the community. We learned today that if you, you know, block the drainage, you will get mosquitoes and then we'll fall ill. Already the parents are saying, ah, I would like my child to go to that peace club. So the, the incentive to send the children to the peace club, and then you, you, you also show that respect. So when they said to us, look for us, the word club means nightclub, we had to show them that it was not a nightclub in order for that trust to be built. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor, for the answer to that question. We have one more question here at the chat box, and it's from Jane. She's wondering if the panelists can speak to any initiative that they have established in their communities to provide psychosocial support to women and girls victims of sexual abuse and if they can educate women and girls on what to do in the unfortunate event that they face this violence. To also bring perpetrators to face the law, victims face multiples of challenge, including stigma from their own communities, in addition to lack of access to seek legal support. So, you know, the Jane wants to know more about any psychosocial support that we have for in the communities for victims of sexual based violence. Lois, do you have any comments on this question? Yes, we have uh, the, the, the psychosocial okay. areas. And in most cases, we have counselors in the faith based organizations who are there and when once we identify a victim 
we recommend the, 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 the counselors, the, the, the victims to the counselors who will go through with them, we will go through them with them and, and help them to overcome the trauma. In case, it, in, in case they may be in the villages, we have also the administration, that is the chiefs and the sub-chiefs, in case they identify such a case, they will report they will report them to us and we or usually help them on where to get help and we're depending on the area they are at thank you okay thank you so much lois dr elena do you have any comments on this question on the psychosocial supports available at the communities for women and girls are victims of sexual abuse Thank you very much, Abby, and thank you for Lois. Uh, thank you too to Lois. Indeed, psychosocial support, you know, being a physician myself is, is a specialized area. And, you know, one of the things that we do as, you know, uh, practitioners is to make sure that when specialist care is needed, that we have an appropriate referral system. So, you know, thankfully, Nigeria has referral guidelines um, sadly, when it comes to psychosocial support, mental health, because of the, the history of stigma around mental health, and uh, um, we have very few practitioners in that area. We desperately need more. We discovered that with the conflicts up and down the country. And, you know, sadly, we do have those who feel, oh, you can become a counselor by going to a one day training. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. You know, you can, if, if you don't have the appropriate skills, you can do more harm to the survivor. And, you know, uh, sexual violence in particular, as we all know, you know, goes, suffers the three S's. I call the three S's silence. There is the culture of silence. There's, the, there's stigma, there's shame. And therefore, you know, um, it's an area that I encourage a lot of us, especially civil society, to, you know, think of, you know, expanding their, their, their networks to, to provide more psychosocial support. It's a much needed area. And in the context of COVID-19, where, you know, violence, especially sexual violence, has risen exponentially. And COVID-19, because of social distancing rules, etc., has even made psychosocial support even more difficult. You know, we, we have known that the training involves one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes the survivor is breaking down. You need to hug the survivor to, you know, you have to listen at close quarters. So can you imagine what those who are undergoing, you know, issues, you know, that require support now are going through? Because even the very few practitioners we have have to socially distance. So, you know, it's a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think it's an important an aspect of this presentation in having support system and a, a link or a referral to any safe space center we want to set up for peace or, or to, to provide support for victims of gender-based violence. In Nigeria, I think that the Spotlight Initiative that is currently ongoing in setting up a safe space center for girls where they can get support and also counseling on issues around sexual and gender-based violence. Similarly, it's also, it's similar to what, we, what they have in Rwanda. It's called Isange. It's a one-stop center that provides um, um, that attends to victims of gender and sexual-based violence. And it's a center that has referral link for psychosocial support, legal support, health, and other necessary support a victim needs. And I think it's something we all should look into. 
setting up a one-stop center, safe space center for victims of gender-based violence and also in whatever peace club we hope to set up. Thank you so much to our speakers for the contribution. Now I will hand over to Salome to go over the summary of the presentation and some of the recommendations that we have highlighted for this section. Um, as I, thank you, Abby. Thank you, Dr. Elena. And thank you, Luis, for sharing. I just wanted to let you know that even in Kenya, we are starting what we are calling polycare. Uh, this will be also a one-stop center to deal with uh, cases of sexual gender-based violence. And this has been informed by the environment that the doctor just mentioned, uh, the COVID-19 environment. So in sharing briefly some of the com com common uh, aspects that I have been able to pick uh, is uh, one, uh, starting with the peace clubs, uh, the fact that men, uh, women, boys and girls are affected differently by conflict and therefore when setting up uh, um, an intervention, you need to think about the impact that conflict has on men, uh, women, boys and girls. The other thing is the fact that the safe spaces that uh, Dr. Elena mentioned are spaces that were identified by the boys uh, and the young girls. And uh, the similarity in that uh, with the Kenyan case study is that uh, the interventions uh, being put on by the border border people uh, together with the, uh, the peace committees that Lois and Tim are working on have been identified by the same people. So when dealing with conflict, it's uh, important that the involved parties are made part and parcel of the interventions that we are seeking to put in place. The question of uh, achievements and uh, uh, that each intervention and case study have been able to get cannot be underscored. Uh, Dr. Elena mentioned to us the numbers of boys and girls who have benefited and the fact that parents have come to appreciate the work of the peace clubs. And something as simple as people understanding that when we talk about clubs, we do not mean the place where people go to take alcohol. That change in narrative and understanding is important. The achievements made by the um, peace committees, uh, Lois was able to explain that uh, the border border people have already started thinking about livelihoods so beyond peace uh, and conflict, people start thinking about livelihoods and how probably uh, their inability to meet their basic needs could be driving them towards conflict. So uh, each case study has brought out different uh, achievements based on the target group and the environment they are operating in. Uh, towards the end, I loved the conversation about trust and how to build trust within our communities. Trust is not built within a day. It is a process that you invest in. There's a lot of community organizing that goes around it, but of importance, the language of peace is key when you're dealing with issues of conflict and peace building. You need to understand the language, you need to understand the meaning that is put towards so that you do not escalate any conflict. Uh, a final similarity was on the referral pathways that exist between um, in the case study of Nigeria and in the case study of uh, Kenya. In Nigeria, we had, they have uh, referral systems and guidelines for the case of Kenya, uh, Lois was able to tell us uh, we have referral systems within civil society, but also the administration and the peace committees themselves are referral pathways. To cap it, uh, the doctor shared with us the three S's that are normally associated or lead to uh, 
associated with trauma. That is the silence, the stigma, and the shame. And she urged all of us as civil society, as people working with communities, to try and invest in psychosocial, something that both the peace clubs and the peace committees have invested in. So as we uh, come towards the end of our session, uh, one of the key recommendations that I'm hearing being mentioned, said silently and loudly, is the aspect of investing in psychosocial support for sexual gender-based violence, be they women, boys, girls, or men. This is key because when somebody is not stable, when somebody is traumatized, they are not able to deal with issues of uh, their own personal conflict, but neither can they intervene in situations where they find other parties conflicting. So if you're not going to carry anything else out of this session, kindly make sure the question of psychosocial becomes part and parcel of what we all should strive to do as people who are working in the field of peace and conflict. So Abby, back to you so that you can wrap up for the session. But I want to say thank you so much to our panelists. Equally, I have learned a lot from Lois and Dr. Elena. To our attendees, the questions you were asking were not just questions, they were questions to make us think deeper of our environment. To the comments that were being put in the chat box, the gratitude comments, the words of encouragement, and the information that was thrown in there for us to take home, I want to say thank you because it will be informative, not just to me, but to the community of women defenders that I work with. Abby, back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Salome, for the summary of the presentation, highlighting some of the major differences within the two case studies, the challenges, and some of the strategies, and also highlighting the lesson learned. You know, you can't quantify the impact of educating or teaching young children about peace values because it's something that they grow up with. So I want to encourage all of us to take that behind, you know, with us as we live in the section. But before we go, final words from the two speakers, starting with Lois, you, your final word, please. Um, uh, thank you very much for everything. I have learned a lot from this meeting and I hope we shall continue uh, learning together and doing the work of peace together. Thank you all for everything. Asante. Asante. Thank you so much, Dr. Eleanor. If I final word, please. Thank you very much to Abby, Salome, the organizers, um, my co-panelists, Lois, and uh, the participants. Thank you for being a very engaged uh, uh, group of friends. This conversation has to continue. I would like to say that ultimately, there is one thing that will hold us all accountable, and that is a global treaty to end every form of violence against women and girls. It will hold our governments accountable. I am looking forward to a day when the world will wake up and realize that we need every nation on earth to sign a global treaty. Please join me and sign for a treaty at everywoman.org, everywoman.org. In the same way that smoking has stopped in our airplanes because of a tobacco treaty, no longer should our women and girls suffer any form of violence. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Happy one. Thank you, doctor, for being here with us. Thanks, Lois. It's important to also note that, you know, we can continue the discussion on this topic and the case studies and share your thoughts and with us on the conference web page. You will see the that at the end of the session for giving us the platform to share our thoughts and also our recommendations towards the promotion of peace in Africa and the rest of the world. To everyone, happy International Peace Day to you all. Thank you so much for contributing to the UNSR 1325 policies and thanks so much for the work you're doing around the world to promote peace. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.